kicking off the list at number 10, Ivan the Terrible. If his name didn't already give you a hint here, Ivan the Terrible was not a great lad. He was rather terrible. His Russian nickname translates to more than evil, so I figured who better to kick off this dark list with than this lad. The first Tsar of Russia back in the mid 1500s. Okay, he created Russia's secret police. Ivan IV enjoyed harming members of nobility and he did so in cruel ways. A ray of sunshine appeared in 1564. Ivan the Terrible officially resigned. And then a year later, however, he immediately came back, so yeah. And then he took control of one third of the Muscovite realms. Not a retirement at all. Right back up on that ruling evil horse, I guess. And then in 1581, he took out his heir to the throne, literally like a Game of Thrones villain. So yeah, he's evil to all those around him and his own family. Number nine, Caligula. Of course, we have to include Caligula on a list of evil lads. We've got to go back to ancient Rome for this one. We're turning the clocks back to 12 AD. The Roman Emperor Nero was already making headlines at this point. He was cruel as well. We'll talk about him later on. But then in comes Caligula to change the game in a weird and also cruel way. He loved spending money and showing off. He once had a two mile long boat, like a floating bridge, just so he could gallop back and forth on his horse. And then everyone was looking and they're like, oh great, cool, cool horse and cool bridge guy. We're all so hungry. He would also order his troops to do odd things, like go into the sea and collect as many seashells as possible. Like that's something you do if you're seven years old. You're like, I want all the seashells now. And they're like, you bet and they collect them. They're like, why do we, do we listen for hints? Why are we doing this? He then built a fancy house for his horse in Citadus. Yeah, not a dog house, not like a shed, like a fancy, rich palace. Why you ask? Well, because Caligula was on his way to appointing said horse into the high office. Yeah, Caligula was taken out sadly before this officially was completed, but he was very close to having his horse in the office of consul. Imagine losing your job to this guy's horse. Imagine the things he would have done. He was on route to do some bad stuff. What a weirdo. Number eight, Queen Ranavalona. The last queen of Madagascar, Queen Ranavalona. One of the worst historically. She, was, uh, she had quite the temper, it seemed. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years in total. She's remembered as cruel, violent, and would often choose you know, violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she went mad with power almost instantly. In the late 1700s, King Andrian originally brought peace to the lands, but naturally there were traditionalists who opposed him. That's not new. That's, you know, we've seen every medieval show. There's people who aren't on board. The king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king beforehand. And that king repaid said local by adopting his daughter, Rana Valona, and now she had to marry his son, Prince Rana. Now, when said prince was alive, they didn't even get along. And come 1810, the king passed away, giving Rana Valona the promotion of a lifetime. But rumor has it, of course, is that Rana Valona poisoned the king. Just a rumor, but it is fitting as to what comes next. Rana Valona kept away the advances of the French and the British by leaving bodies of those who tried to attack prior out on display. Yeah, just sitting there on the beach, like some queen... Cersei type stuff, I don't know. This, I've been watching a lot of Game of Thrones recently, a lot of evil people. In 1845, Queen Rana Valona ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months, this massive buffalo hunt, and well, 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation during this, and of course, exhaustion. And not one buffalo was even hunted. Just poor leadership and deaths, a lot of deaths. Number seven, Jolly Jane Toppin. Okay, getting a little more recent for this one. In the 1880s, Jane Toppin, AKA Jolly Jane, is now confessing to killing 31 people. And with that nickname and that many victims, yeah, I have to talk about her. Jolly Jane Toppin was a nurse working in Massachusetts. She would take care of the elderly, but instead of TLC, Jane would give them morphine and atropine. And to make things even more horrible, if such thing exists, Jane would lay next to her victim after she poisoned them and just would lie there while they were passing away. Yeah, evil, just evil and twisted, right? Just the worst thing ever. She managed to take the souls of 31 patients, but those numbers potentially reached the hundreds. She eventually and thankfully got caught and spent the remainder of her days lying alone in an asylum. Yeah, these killings began when she was younger after a boyfriend dumped her. That was the, the start of her mental decline, apparently. Number six, George Chapman. Going back to the late 1800s again for this guy. He began his career as a Polish doctor, but in 1888, he moved to London, and that's when things got a little dicey. Once he arrived in London, Chapman sought out four mistresses, not three, not two, 
Four. Despite already being married beforehand, which you probably could have predicted, George was a doctor, he was a cheater, and you could have guessed it by the title of this list, he was also a killer. He poisoned all four of those mistresses with arsenic. Chapman was also thankfully caught and later was executed for these horrible crimes in 1903. This guy was so bad, they actually thought perhaps this was Jack the Ripper, but that's been proven otherwise. Isn't that crazy? Like, oh, we thought you were this horrible person, but you're just your own unique horrible person. Nice. Now there's two of you. Horrible. Number five, Anna Ivanova. Anna Ivanova, the cruel ice princess, AKA the Empress of Russia back in 1730 to 1740. Where to begin? Okay, first of all, when you think ice princess, you want to put a magical spin on it, right? Cause that's all we know. Well, this was Russia in the 1700s. This was not a magical fun time. Not a Disney princess, that's for sure. To celebrate their victory over the Ottoman Empire, Anna Ivanova gave the order to build an ice house, sorry, <clears throat> an ice palace, rather, to celebrate the marriage of one of her maids and a prince. Sounds joyous almost, magical, one would say. Thing is, these guys didn't know each other prior to getting married, so that was weird as is, right? Can't forget that detail. They were complete strangers, but then they were forced to marry each other in a freezing cold palace literally made of ice in the dead of night. They had to ride an elephant as well as a newlywed couple. Or elephant. And all the guests, they were also forced to dress up like clowns for this entire party. So even if you weren't getting married, you were forced to be humiliated still. All in the name of said ice queen. Yeah, a little different than Frozen, I'd say. A little tiny bit different than Frozen. This Anna is not great. Number four, Nero. Yeah, we gotta mention Nero. If we're gonna talk smack about Caligula and his high horse, literally, we gotta include Nero. This was ancient Rome back in 68 CE. Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus. He burned down Rome. That's that's pretty bad. That's memorable, I'd say. Dare I say, even more memorable than a horse palace. It's a messed up family, okay. Nero was heir of the Emperor Claudius, the fifth Roman emperor. He wiped out his entire family in horrible, different, unique ways, dare I say. And historically, it's believed that Nero lit the fire that burned down Rome. But he made it look like the Christians did. Once all was lost in the empire, Nero took his own life. Yeah, just all bad. Just bad leadership, bad Caligula and his horse, Nero, everything's burning. Rome was not pleasant. Not a pleasant time. They had aqueducts and horrible history. Number three, H. H. Holmes. His fascination with medicine began at a young age. He used to perform fictional surgeries on his stuffed animals, always a red flag, awesome. H.H. went on to medical school and shortly after finishing, he began killing people in order to steal their property. He then built himself this massive, terrifying custom house that he had to build to include things like secret passages, trap doors, soundproof rooms, doors that locked from the outside with like gas jets on the inside. He even had a kiln to cremate his bodies. Is he the devil? I would say worse than the devil. I'd rather make a deal with the devil than meet H.H. H. Holmes any day, literally. Holmes gets close with women in order to take control of their finances and then later kill them, but he would also require his employees to fill out life insurance policies that named him as a beneficiary. Some of the bodies he even ended up selling to medical schools. How gross is that? Eventually, he was found out, nice, he was caught, and then sentenced, of course, to death. Not nearly enough times. It isn't exactly known how many victims he had, but it's thought to be somewhere over 200. Number two, Elizabeth Bathory. The Hungarian noblewoman was every Everything but. Yeah, back in the late 16th century and even in the early 17th century, Elizabeth would meet young peasants and ask them to come work at her castle, right? This is a good day for peasants. She promised them a high paying job as a servant. That's a way better deal than being broke outside of the castle. So many times, if not all the time, these poor folk would come back with her. When they arrived to the castle, that's when things would change. That's when the tone would kind of shift. She would then brutally harm them. She would trap them, torture them, really just all the worst of the worst. And then finally, once she was bored or ready for the next house guest to arrive, she would finish them off. The number of fatalities here is somewhere around 80 peasants, but historically that number has also gone up to 600 in some accounts. So 80 to 600. Okay, come 1611, things changed. She was locked up in her own castle with barely any sunlight, nice. She was feeling the weight of her actions. Hopefully she was learning a few lessons here, but four years later in 1614, she passed away. Yeah, next to Vlad the Impaler, she's been a large inspiration behind Bram Stoker's Dracula. Yeah, that's... That's, that's bad, that's, that's really bad. Number one, Mao Zedong. Okay, getting into some pretty high numbers here. The dictator of China from 1943 to 1976, Mao Zedong. He had this vision one day that China would be the superpower, the super country, and in order to do so, he tried to reshape China's economy and turn it into an industrial one. From 1958 to 1962, the Great Leap Forward policy ended up leading to the deaths of around 45 million people. This makes the Great Chinese Famine the largest in human history. Again, this is also an estimate. The deaths were somewhere around 30 to 60 million. 
That feels like the number one to me. I don't know, I'd say that's the number one. Can't really rate evil and bad, but definitely can't put that at number eight, can we? Kicking off the list at number 10, Luigi Luceni. Back in the late 1800s, the Empress Elizabeth of Austria was sadly taken out by a man named Luigi Luceni. He wasn't a royal, he wasn't a long lost son, he wasn't hired help, nothing like that. He was just somebody who wanted to attack a royal. Any royal, for that matter, just didn't, no reason at all. He didn't have anything against Empress Elizabeth per se, but come September 10th, 1898, he took the Empress's life. In his own admission, Luigi stated he had nothing against the Empress on a personal level, but what had really happened that day was Luigi had intended on taking the life of the Duke of Orleans. But Luigi arrived too late in Geneva, and the opportunity to do so had passed. He looked at a local newspaper then, saw Elizabeth, found out where she was staying, and then just waited for her to leave the hotel. Just like that, that is so scary. People are insane, that is just number 10. Number nine, Olga of Kiev. This one also feels like it's from Game of Thrones. Not much is known of the Ukrainian royal, but back in 903 AD, her ruling began. And history was never quite the same. Her husband was the soon to be Igor, ruler of the Kievan Rus. Come 945, the Dravillians prevailed and took out the king, leaving one Olga in charge. An angry, heartbroken Olga, that is. The Dravillians actually told Olga at this point to marry their own prince. They were adding insult to injury. How rude is that? So Olga said, sure. Yeah, let's do it. Send 20 men to talk about this arranged marriage, and let's do it, let's get planning. You 20, go wait in the bathhouse, and we'll talk shop soon. So when the men arrived, she then locked the doors on said bathhouse, and then they never left. There's a lot of fire, really bad stuff. And that was just the beginning. Olga then invited 5,000 Dravillians over for a feast. Once everybody drank more than enough, she straight up wed writing to her entire company. It was awful. This was the same lady who promoted Christianity in history. She was a literal saint. Historically, we refer to her as a saint. How crazy is that? I mean, you know, war history and stuff. Obviously, times are different, but like, this, this is dark. To, to physically do that to that many people is dark. It's all dark. History is dark. Everyone's, everyone sucks. Number eight, King John of England. We've heard of Richard the Lionheart, but his brother, King John, not a pleasant fellow by any means. He was a pretty brutal king. He turned his back towards his family and friends and of course the country. His reign began in 1299 and by the time it ended in 1216, the country was screwed. It was pretty much bankrupt at that point. And that was the least of your concerns though if you knew King John personally. He had 12 illegitimate children, but afterwards he had all of their relatives and family taken out, just eliminated, just like that. If you looked at him the wrong way, you're going to jail. King John loved imprisoning people. He was so bad as a ruler that Robin Hood was actually inspired from his days of ruling. Yeah, we created myths to combat this maniacal ruler. He declared war against France. He stole from the church. He then ordered all clergy to leave. And in horrible historical fashion, Jewish people were also horribly singled out and they had all their belongings stolen and then they were then imprisoned or worse, brutally punished. All for nothing, all because this clown was born. Number seven, Commodus. We mentioned Nero and Caligula in part one, so why not dip our toes back in the ancient Roman waters again? Specifically, 180 AD. Commodus wasn't exactly the most evil per se, but he didn't pay attention while he was in the driver's seat. He let things slide, he let things go south. He was too busy modeling himself after Hercules. He also portrayed himself as Hercules. I guess that's important, that's how you want to be remembered. Sure, great, that's a one way to do it. But his love of the Roman games, that's where you start thinking, oh, something's up here. Maybe he is evil. Maybe he's actually quite evil all along. Who knew? Who would have thunk? He loved watching these Roman games so much that he finally entered himself. Yeah, he would just step in and brutally fight animals, humans, you name it. And then after it was done, he would charge the state a massive fee because, well, Commodus the mighty, holy Commodus, he made an appearance. And we're lucky, so now we should pay him. Okay, okay pal. He was so focused on how he wanted to be remembered in history that in 192 AD, he renamed Rome after himself. Yeah, and if that wasn't bad enough, he then changed all the 12 months to his 12 other names. A year later when he was, you know, taken out, all the names were changed back immediately. So he has no idea. No one tell him. Number six, King Henry VIII. Catherine Howard was the Queen of England from 1540 to 1541. That's such a, such a short amount of time, but why? What happened? Well, Catherine Howard was the fifth wife of one King Henry VIII, cousin to Anne Boleyn, referred to by King Henry as his rose without a thorn. And he just gave her all the gifts. Just at 19 years old, here you go, everything you want, boom. 
It looked great at first, but their marriage only lasted one year. That's when rumors, not letters or eyewitnesses, no, rumors started spreading about infidelity. And this is a medieval time, so there was little evidence that suggested that she had been romantically involved with somebody beforehand, but that didn't matter. We had a jealous king, so anything he says goes. You had me at fifth wife, you know? She was then executed for adultery and treason at the Tower Green, February 13th, 1542. Number five, Linda Hazard. Cool last name, kind of tips you off a little bit. She's been dubbed as the starvation doctor because back in the day, the late 1800s that is, if you somehow ended up in the office of one Linda Hazard, well, it didn't really matter what you were suffering with. Linda's advice, her, sorry, medical advice, for pretty much everything that came in was too fast. A broken leg? No problem, just skip lunch. See how you feel, give it time. Just a bad doctor, which is bad on one hand, but more than 40 of her patients ended up dying due to, you know, starvation. Yeah, you could have guessed. She had her own sanitarium in Washington that was appropriately named Starvation Heights. Yeah, she wasn't even trying to hide it too. She's like, yeah, I'll call it this. You would think after like, I don't know, 16 deaths, people would start asking questions. No, this is a long time ago. This is before a lot of things came into play. Eventually, Hazard was caught, convicted, and served two years in prison. And then 26 years later, in 1938, she herself died of, you guessed it, starvation. Don't take your own advice, Linda. It's not, it's not great advice. Number four, Michael Swango. Going back to the 1980s for this one, kind of recent, okay? As a youngin, Michael Swango didn't play with Lego or Connects, my personal favorite. Instead, he would draw scenes of horrible crimes. Yeah, red flags, for sure. That went away for a bit when he grew up and got older, but when Michael later went to college, he decided to write his chemistry thesis on Georgi Markov. More specifically, he studied his horrific death caused by poison. Yeah, he was fascinated after that point. His newfound obsession was poisons and how many lives they took historically, like ancient Roman days. You know, really going back. Odd thing to study, but okay. During his third year at school, five patients that saw him ended up passing away afterwards. This happened often, it's happened more and more, but one individual luckily survived, and she remembered everything that happened. She remembered that Swango had injected her with something a minute before she started to experience seizures. He still got away with it somehow, but then later he went to another hospital in Ohio in 1984, and he handed out donuts that later made the staff feel sick. And then when they required treatment, he then Poisoned them. He got caught, was then sentenced to five years, but was released after two. He then changed his name, moved to Virginia, got a job as a career counselor, and then poisoned those co-workers as well. He got caught after doing this like three more times. Now he's finally serving three life sentences at ADX Supermax Federal Prison. It's hard to sum up in a minute or so with just how many things he's done and how many lives he's took. It's really bad, but I implore you to read more about him. The Poison Doctor. My gosh, I'm having nightmares tonight. Number three, Thomas Cream. Thomas Neil Cream, TNC, another Canadian monster. Originally, he graduated from McGill back in 1876, and after that, he traveled to London, England. This was during the time of the Industrial Revolution, so the demand for doctors here was extremely high. Thomas was there for business, and apparently he was there for pleasure. He enjoyed London's nightlife a lot. He would dance, drink, hook up with strangers, just, you know, all the things you don't want your medical doctor doing, just mere hours before a shift. But on November 15th, 1892, there were thousands gathered outside the Newgate prison walls, eagerly awaiting the execution of one Dr. Thomas Cream. Well, now he's referred to as the Lambeth Poisoner. If you had the misfortune of seeing this doctor as well, odds are he too would have tried to poison you. Just because. Yeah, poison doctors. How common are these guys? He actually did get caught once. He was convicted of poisoning a woman. He was given life in prison, but apparently it's all about who you know. His brother bribed the governor of Illinois, so he poisoned five more people in London before eventually getting arrested again, and then finally executed, this time for a crowd. Number two, Elizabeth Wettlaufer. The scariest people are the ones who abuse their power. I mean, doctors, evidently. I mean, historically, there have been some pretty evil ones. Elizabeth Wettlaufer is one of the worst, hands down. She was once a nurse at not one, but several long-term care facilities in Southern Ontario. Really and close to home with this one. Elizabeth would use doses of insulin on their patients, that was her discreet way of taking lives, but it gets even worse, dare I say, if you can believe that. After the patient had passed away, Elizabeth would then steal their belongings. In 2016, she quit her nursing job and then checked herself into a psychiatric hospital and confessed to all of her crimes. Those being eight counts of first degree, four counts of attempted, and two counts of aggravated assault. Absolutely brutal. These happened from 2007 to 2016 in Woodstock, Ontario. Yeah, Woodstock of all places. Elizabeth is now in her late 50s serving eight concurrent life sentences, but after 25 years, thanks to Canadian law, she gets a chance at parole. Scary, huh? Yep, I'd agree. And finally, number one, 
Queen Isabella of Spain. Look, we got pretty dark on this list, so we'll, you know, we'll peel back the layers of unholiness for our last one here. We'll go to the 15th century. We'll go to Queen Isabella of Spain. She once ruled with King Ferdinand II for a while. She ruled from 1451 to 1504. While in power, she forced Catholicism upon all. Yeah, if you were Jewish, you had to attend the Spanish court and then convert, and if not, the queen tossed you up. Horrible stuff. Recently, however, there have been a few calls to have her monuments removed from Canadian parks. At McDonald's Park, for example, a monument has been up since 1958, and it's to honor the Queen's role in Columbus's arrival to the Americas. There's even a street named right after her, right across from the monument. Locals want all of it removed and or changed because, you know, they're not fans of genocide. These changes are actively being made throughout Canada right now, which is nice to see. Ryerson University recently changed its name to Toronto Metropolitan University because of Edgerton Ryerson's previous ties with Canadian residential schools. So it's happening. Slowly but surely, changes are happening. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Jonathan Moulton. Jonathan is a man who was born in 1726 and he was known for his military career. He served in King George's War as well as in the French and Indian Wars, but after his service is where this story really starts. Basically, after his time fighting was over, he went on to become one of New England's wealthiest men. This caused heads to swivel and rumors to swirl because this wasn't something that was normally seen. This all gave way for the rumor that Jonathan had struck this luck of fortune because he was actually working with the devil. People began to say that for financial gain, he in turn gave his eternal devotion and even his soul over to the devil. The devil would visit him every month in order to fill his boot up with gold. You know what happens with things like this though, people get greedy. It is said that despite this lavish lifestyle he was already living, he wanted more, and this led him to make the mistake of trying to trick the devil. He cut a hole in the floor above his basement and placed a boot over it which also had a hole in the heel. Of course he did this so that when the devil came with the gold, he'd get a whole basement full rather than just a boot. But the devil certainly caught on. From there it is said that he burned down Jonathan's house along with all of the gold that lay inside. So the moral of the story is don't try and trick the devil. Just kidding, it's don't be greedy. In our number six spot today, we have George Lukens. Back in 1778, George Lukens was an English tailor who people began to notice was starting to behave in ways that were considered strange. What I mean by this is that it was said that he started speaking in strange voices, making strange sounds, and that he was even singing hymns backwards. Of course, this was 1778 after all, so they decided that an exorcist was in order. They had the event in Bristol's Temple Church and they had seven priests come to assist as it is said that he didn't just have the devil hanging over him but that he actually had seven different demons. The priests commanded the demons who had taken over his soul to leave once and for all. Surprisingly, it is said that this ceremony actually worked and that when it was over, George recited the Lord's Prayer, thanked all of the priests and went on his merry way. An exorcism with a happy ending. Don't see a lot of those. In our number five spot today, we have Gottlieb and Dittus. This story comes to us from 1842 from a small German village. In this year, residents of the village began to notice some strange happenings coming from the house of a 28 year old woman named Gottlieb. She was claiming that her house was haunted and she began slipping in and out of what people referred to as trance like states. Other than these claims and what was going on with these states, nothing truly extraordinarily weird was happening, of course, until a religious pastor came along and began performing an exorcism. Gottlieb became super violent, which feels like a pretty fair reaction to an exorcism, whether you were being possessed or not, and she ended up being physically restrained. Here's where things really go off the rails though. She ended up being restrained for two years. Two years. Not months, not days, not weeks, years, while multiple exorcisms were performed on her. During these, she was seen vomiting glass, nails, and of course blood. Despite this horrific story, things ended on an all right note with her telling everyone that the demons were gone and that Jesus is the victor. In our number four spot today, we have Dr. Richard Gallagher. I'm a person who likes to believe in and follow science. You know, it's like the most tangible way to explain things that are seemingly impossible or unreal. You know what I mean? That is why this guy kind of freaks me out so much. So basically, Dr. Richard Gallagher is a certified Ivy League psychiatrist
interest and he is a self-proclaimed man of science. Like many science people, when he initially heard of exorcisms or possessions, he thought that they were just an ancient and outdated excuse or explanation for people who were actually struggling with different mental illness. Now however, while still being that self-proclaimed man of science, he had an experience that changed his perspective forever on demonic possession. Basically it all started when he met someone who was referred to as the Queen of Satan. Her real name was Julia and she came to the church claiming possession. Considering the fact that she was involved of and part of a satanic cult, he wanted to know why, if she really was possessed, that she would want to rid herself of the demons. When the two sat down together, weird things started. She knew strange, intimate details of his life that she had absolutely no reason to know, objects would randomly fly off of the walls, and later, long after their meeting, during a phone call with a priest, both Richard and the priest he was speaking to heard one of the demonic voices it is said that Julia would speak in over the phone, despite the fact that she was literally on the other side of the country from them. In the end, it is said that this experience in meeting the Queen of Satan and all of the subsequent meetings with people like her that he had afterwards caused him to completely change his outlook. He now sits on the line in between the world of science and reason and the world of the unexplainable. In our number 3 spot today we have Michael Taylor. This story is about an Englishman named Michael Taylor and it starts off in 1974. Michael was a husband and father of 5 children but was unfortunately struggling with frequent bouts of depression which is difficult for anyone to manage. Seemingly however, when he met a 21 year old pastor named Marie Robinson, these bouts became less harsh and more manageable. So far this seems like a nice little story about someone getting the help they need, but that is not the case at all. Apparently he claimed his depression was getting better due to the pastor's ability to exercise the demons that were plaguing him with this illness. Michael's wife is like, yeah okay, likely story, and she confronts him about what she believes is going on, which is that he is having an affair with Mary. After this confrontation, he physically attacks his wife, which then led to him getting an actual exorcism by two ministers on October 5th, 1974. During this exorcism, Michael had seizures, he spit and bit the ministers, and he screamed in tongues. After going through all of that, you'd expect this guy to be free of whatever the heck was going on, but unfortunately, the following day, he brutally took the life of his own wife. If all of this wasn't enough to make a dreadful story, he ended up not even being convicted because the defense argued that the exorcism made him insane. So cursed by the devil or just a terrible person? At this point, we're not really sure. Maybe a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. In our number two spot today, we have The Bell Witch. So this story is one that inspired one of the most classic horror films of all time, The Blair Witch Project. Basically, this story follows the family of John Bell, who is said to have once had this wicked neighbor called Kate Batts. Kate believed that John cheated her out of land, and since there were rumors swirling that she was a witch, there was also a rumor that she cursed the Bell family. Basically, this made it so that that the family was now being cursed and basically haunted by a demon. This force would throw pots and pans, spill things, slam doors, rattle chains. It would have members of the family getting scratched, pinched, and sometimes worse by this invisible thing. Things were bad, and when people came to visit the family at the farm, they didn't get any trouble from the spirit, but could hear its voice that was described as being high, scratchy, and shrill. In the end, the farm became an incredibly popular tourist attraction, and one year, John fell mysteriously ill, which people believe was the work of Kate and her powerful spells. To this day, people still report strange happenings at the farm. In our number one spot today, we have Urbain Grandier. Born in 1590, Urbain was a French Catholic priest who was known as being a little promiscuous with some of the nuns. Look, there's no judgement from me at all, but I'm just saying, the Catholic Church now doesn't like that. I can't imagine pre-1600s Catholic Church just being cool with that, but anyway, it's said that he actually took quite a public stance against the church's view on celibacy. Because of his escapades, there were points where people who had indulged with him were now accusing him of witchcraft and using dark magic in order to tempt them. This led to a trial which did end in acquittal, but France's chief minister named Cardinal did not like Urbain at all. The priest had apparently published some less than kind criticisms about him, so naturally Cardinal returned the favour and ordered a second trial. This time Urbain was put through some grueling interrogation 
investigations, and while it certainly was inhumane, it led to the discovery of quite a document, one that was apparently found in his belongings. It was a contract that is said to have been written in Latin and covered with strange symbols. The contract was signed by Urbane as well as several demons, including the devil himself. Basically, the contract promised Urbane the love of women, the respect of monarchs, that sort of thing, in exchange for his allegiance to the devil. In the end, this led to Urbane being found guilty of making a deal with the devil, and he was sentenced to death. Thank you.